as I said, I particularly enjoy reading Psalm 19. Uh, it would be one of my go-to psalms of, uh, of what to read if I couldn't think of anything else. And I love the way it just points us to three different ways that we can get a brief glimpse of the glory of God. Three different things of that God uses to reveal himself to us. Firstly, we see God reveals himself to us through creation. Then we see God reveals himself to us through the law, through his word. The word that was fulfilled in Christ. And finally, God reveals himself to us through fellow believers. Or I should possibly say God should be able to reveal himself to us through fellow believers. I don't think it would shock you if I said this morning that not everyone believes in God. We see a sad world where many people deny the very existence of a divine being. Apparently the 2011 census, I think we've had another one since then, the 2011 census revealed that 60% of the population identify as a Christian. That's 60%. However, in the same year, a YouGov poll found that 34% of the people believe that there is a God. Therefore, there are 26, at least 26% of people who identify as a Christian and yet don't believe there is a God, which is phenomenal. The fact that in 2011, 66%, two-thirds of the nation, didn't believe that there was a God at all, astounds me. I don't know how accurate all those numbers are, but we can see all through history the devil trying to cast doubt on God. The devil is trying to cast doubt to us about God. A doubt as to the power, the trustworthiness, or even the existence of God. And we don't have to open our Bibles very far to find the devil at work in this attempt to cast doubt as to the trustworthiness of God. He couldn't attack Adam and Eve on their belief of God because God walked with them in the Garden of Eden. So in Genesis chapter 3, we see the devil. And in verse 1, a really powerful question. He said to Eve, Did God actually say to you not to eat? of any tree in the garden. And you can put whatever tone you like on that. And I would read it as, did God really say not to eat from that tree? One of the first things he did since the world was created was try and cast doubt in the minds of Adam and Eve as to the instructions that God had given her. As to whether those instructions were actually any good, he goes on to say, you will not die, in verse 4. God knows when you eat it, your eyes will be opened. We see a little bit later in Scripture with Job. And in Job chapter 1, uh, we see this discourse between God and Satan. Uh, and that God asks Satan, have you seen my servant Job? He is brilliant. He's the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless a man of integrity. And Satan says, well, no. He's only good because he has a reason to fear you. You've always protected him. Take away those protections and you won't see him prosper anymore. That's what happens. Many of the protections around Job are taken away. Sadly, he loses his livelihood, his family, even much of his health. We see towards the end, Job still praises God and still trusts him, despite the unhelpful friends that he chooses. He still trusts God. But the devil tried to take away the security that he found in God. 
this continues. The Pharisees, uh, I would argue, in many ways, tools of Satan while, while Christ was on earth, tried to undermine the truthfulness, the faithfulness, the power of Christ. Today, many people seek to undermine the power of God, the, the trustworthiness, the goodness of God, even the very existence of God. We live in an interesting world where many atheists are as evangelistic as we are, if not more so, in their vehement disregard for the very existence of God, their dismissiveness of anyone that believes in a God. People who try and use science or reason to explain away God, ignoring the holes in their work. The God-shaped holes, one could often argue. Fundamentally, people don't want to believe in God because as soon as you do believe in God, you recognize that there is, there is something greater than you. And as humans, we like to be the greatest. We like to be the most powerful. We like to be in control. So therefore, the devil uses all sorts of people, all sorts of things to declare there is no God, to make people blind to his ways. David says in Psalm 53, it's the fool who says in his heart that there is no God. It's a fool who says in his heart there is no God. So amongst this backdrop of people, through the devil I would argue, trying to persuade people that there is no God, I would argue that there is clear evidence for a creator God, a saving God, and I'm not going to go through all of that today, but Psalm 19, as I have already said, gives us three declarations of the existence of God. Firstly, creation declares he exists. The heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19, verse 1. Uh, the sky proclaims his handiwork day to day, night to night, revealing knowledge. There is no speech, there's no words, uh, there's no voice that's heard. Their voice, but their voice goes out through all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. People have been mystified by the stars since the dawn of creation. People have tried to understand it. Even look at the wise men in Jesus' day. Why did they travel? Because they saw a star. Why did they see a star? Because they were studying the stars. The studying of the stars has captivated people for centuries. I, I am a, a rural person at heart and I love being in a place where there's no street lights or cars or anything and you can look up at the sky and you can see so much more of the stars in the sky that is truly wonderful. If you go to Felixstowe Docks and try and look up, you can't see too much because you're blinded by all the floodlights. But in the middle of nowhere, just the more you lay and look at the stars, the more appear. And it's truly phenomenal. And David says, those stars, the sky is shouting for all who will listen of the power of God shouting just how wonderful God is. If you believe that God made the heavens and the earth, then those stars are just but a brief glimpse of his power, a brief glimpse of his glory. And yet how wonderful they are. Day by day and night by night, we're never left without evidence of God's power. We see it at night. I've talked about the stars, but we can see it in the day as the sun passes overhead uh, um, verse uh, 5 talks about the sun being uh, in a tent, the sky being the tent and like a bridegroom leaving his chamber coming out one side in the morning and going back in the evening the strong man running its course there is nothing hidden from the sun every part of this earth can see the sun and if we think about the power of the sun, it's just 
brief glimpse of the power of God. Apparently, and I haven't measured, you can fit a million Earths inside the sun. That's how big it is. The heat from the sun travels many, many miles to us and warms us. I think we've all, over the last couple of weeks, understood the power of the sun. It's been warm uh, in this country. The sun is truly amazing. And yet it's just a brief glimpse of the power of God. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 tells us that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and the wickedness of people. Since what may, may be known about God is made plain to them, because God has made it plain, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen from what has been made. Since the beginning of creation, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, sorry, I think that was reading from the NIV there, uh, have been clearly seen, telling everyone about God. So therefore, no one has an excuse. And yet, time and time again, people try to deny the existence of God. Apparently, I have a list of, well, I definitely have a list of ten facts. I believe they're all true. I did try and check some of the verifiable sources, but who knows. If the Earth were just one little bit closer to the Sun, it says in my notes one degree, but I don't know quite how a degree works. But if the Earth was just, I, if the Earth was a little bit closer to the Sun, uh, we would be too hot to, to, to exist. If it was just a little bit further away, uh, the planet would freeze and therefore would be uninhabitable. If the Moon was closer or bigger, its power over the tides would be so much greater that many nations would flood and then. Uh, waves would destroy coastlines. If it was any smaller or further away, therefore gravitational pull being less, the oceans would die from a lack of nutrient movement. Uh, we need the tides to move things around. Jupiter is a wonderful planet and it stops the Earth being hit by many asteroids and comets that would hit it by its gravitational pull. If Jupiter was any closer to us, however, its gravitational pull on us would change orbits and therefore we may become unstable. The gravity, the force of gravity is just enough to keep what we need nearby, uh, but uh, to, to keep the things we don't need far enough away in the atmosphere. The Earth's crust is just thick enough to be stable beneath our feet, but not so thick that it wants to absorb all the oxygen that we need. If any of those are wrong, please tell me later and I'll cross them out and never uh, use them again. But if even just one of those facts is true, how great is a creator God? Secondly, God's law, God's word declares he exists. David obviously talking about uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. I will reference the whole of Scripture and Christ who was uh, the fulfillment of that law. For many people to say the law of anything is perfect and refreshing would sound weird. If I were to say to you, speed limits are refreshing and perfect, people would disagree. Some people want to drive faster, some people want to drive slower, and we won't uh, have a raising of hands to see who's on which side of that line. But any law has some controversies, but not so the law of God. The law of God, verse 7, is perfect and refreshing. Actually, by the way we're created, we like rules. People like to know where to fit in, where they fit, how things should be. And I've often used the example of when I was a teacher of a PD day. PD days were wonderful days. No children turned up, but you got to go to work, so you didn't 
um, have to stay at home and look after your own children. So there were benefits all round, but I never knew what to wear. On a normal work day, I wore a shirt and tie. I despised the fact I had to wear a tie, but on those other days, I used to drive into the car park and I genuinely used to sit in my car until someone else got out of theirs and I'd seen that they were wearing jeans and then I knew it was safe to go in wearing jeans and a polo shirt. One day at the end of COVID, we were told when we returned, we had to do, five, I think I had to do five days teaching year 10 or something. And we were told, don't worry about uniform. If the children aren't wearing uniform, you don't need to be smart. You need to be smart casual. I took the, I read the casual word far more than the smart word and turned up in trousers, trousers and a polo shirt. And yet all of my colleagues had still worn proper shirt and tie. And I stuck out like a sore thumb and everyone referenced it for the entire day. Actually, what I'd have rather hit they'd have said is wear a shirt, a proper shirt and smart trousers and you'll be fine. Sometimes rules are refreshing and we can see just a picture of that in our mind. I'm sure there's situations that you've been in where you like to know the rules. Even in the, the swimming pool, do you swim anti-clockwise or clockwise in the lane? If you don't have that rule, you, you swim into people head first. Sometimes knowing where we, we stand helps. Rules and laws to many sound like a negative thing and by nature we like to resist against them. But truthfully, we all take comfort from the fairness and the justice of the law of the land. And therefore we should all take comfort from the fairness and justice of the law of God because the law of God is perfect. Therefore, it reveals to us something of his nature. Some would say that the first part of Psalm 19 is a general revelation through creation. And now we have a specific revelation through God's word. A specific revelation telling of us of more detail about God. The law of God declares to us so much. We see his justice. The fact that things have to be made right for God to welcome, in, welcome them into his perfect kingdom. But we see his love as prophesied, as revealed through Christ. We see the specific ways that he is great as we read the accounts of creation. We see the specific ways of how faithful and trustworthy he is as we look at the life of Joseph and we see the difficulties he faced and how they were all part of a bigger picture. God's word declares to us he exists. It makes us wise. Verse 8 tells us the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. As we read God's word, do we rejoice when we see just how great he is? Or do we turn into our Bibles and think, I need to read seven verses or I'm not going to keep up with my reading plan. We shouldn't be like that. We should come to God's word rejoicing because we see but a brief glimpse of his greatness. The law of God is like gold. Much fine gold and sweeter than honey. The dripping from the honeycomb. In today's context, we may change those words. I, I, I don't know how much I, I value gold anymore. I'm sure on a national scale in some banking system, I do value gold. But I don't desire to be chained in it. Wear chains of gold. Chained in it sounds slightly different, doesn't it? Wear chains of gold. But whatever you're of great value, the law of God is worth more than it. Whatever your favourite food is, whether it's salt and vinegar crisps or a Mars bar or pure honey from a honeycomb, God's words are better than it. The law of God is great. Do we see the greatness of God through his word? I hope so. Do we actively spend time searching for the greatness of God through his word? I hope so. One of the great things about God's word is what it does for us. I've already said it makes us wise, it gives us joy. But more than that, it warns us. Verse 11 of Psalm 19 said, Moreover, by them, by the words of God, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. 
obviously as David wrote this, he was thinking of the Old Testament law and realized that he was warned not to stray from the way of God or you would uh, see wrath and condemnation. He had to stick to certain uh, rituals for forgiveness or face wrath and condemnation. We have so much more scripture now, but still by then we are warned. We are warned that to reject Christ, to reject his power, to reject his sonship of God, to reject the sacrifices made on the cross will lead to wrath and condemnation. If everyone should be able to see evidence for a God through creation, everyone should be able to see evidence for exactly what they need to do through God's word. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Repent and be baptized and you will be saved by faith. Thirdly and finally, most briefly and possibly most difficultly, there should be a revelation of God through his believers. God should be able to reveal himself through his followers, through his children. Firstly, we're made in the image of God. Just by creation, we are a reflection of God's uh, beauty, God's power. But as we carry on through this psalm and we read, we read verse 12, Verse 12 says, Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden fault. Well, that brings us back a bit to the warnings uh, contained in Scripture. We are so sinful by nature that we can't actually discern our errors. We can't see our fault. We need God to do that for us. And we need him to declare us innocent. The Old Testament uh, sacrificial system only had a way of redemption from accidental sins. Purposeful sins were much more difficult to deal with. And yet, in Christ, we have forgiveness from all sin. Therefore, we can be declared innocent. If you've never prayed that kind of prayer before, O oh God, declare me innocent, forgive me for my faults, for my sins, then I would urge you, I would beg you to do so. And in faith, Pray a prayer like that and God will forgive you for those sins. But there's more to it than that. Once we are declared innocent, our lives should be transformed. 1 Peter, which we've been looking through on a Tuesday night, and it says this, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2 and verse 9, you speaking to believers, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into light. You are a chosen people so that you may proclaim the excellencies of God, the one who called you from darkness to light. We have a purpose. That purpose is to proclaim the excellencies of of God. Therefore, God should be revealed through his people. How? Through a distinctive and radical life. A life where, as David says in verse 12, we are kept back from sin. Sin is such a temptation, it's such a draw, it's such an attraction. David prays, keep me from it. Keep me from sinful ways. Keep me from the temptations that lead me to sin. We have to remember that David was a fallen man, a broken man. We see that he wasn't perfect. And yet he had a desire, at least at this moment, to be kept back from sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Let not the sin in this world and in my life have power over me. How much... Does sin have power over us? How addictive are those things that we so desire in a worldly way? And when we think of addiction, we, we think of 
drugs or smoking or drink or, or food. Yes, some of those addictions are, they're, they're all bad. If things have dominion over us, it's sinful. But there's so many more things that we can be addicted to that have dominion over us. Our pride has dominion over us. The reason I, would, I, I struggle to ask for help is because pride has dominion over me. Our jealousy can have dominion over us. Our desire to slander or stir up dissension can have dominion over us. We think we have these things under control and then they burst forth from our mouth. As David says, please, God, don't let them have dominion over us. Let us be different. Let us be blameless and innocent of transgression. And therefore we will be different. We will look different to an onlooking world. And therefore Christ will be revealed through us. Christ will be revealed through us. Three ways that God is revealed. Creation, his word, his believers. If we're not revealing him to other people, then we should probably look at our lives and question what has dominion over us. If we need help, what's the greatest help we can have? Surely prayer. How can we pray? How does David pray? Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, the very desires, the things that I dwell upon be acceptable in your sight. We often reveal our sin through our mouth. We often reveal our sin through the things that we think about, the things, the meditations of our heart, the things that hold us captive. Where does our mind go in a moment of rest? Lord God, let the, the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. Because we have a God that we can rely upon, a God that we can lean upon, our rock and our redeemer, our strength and the one who saves. We can rely on him. He is our foundation. The words of God should be our foundation. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you once again for creation. I thank you for your word and I thank you for fellow believers. And I thank you that time and time again when I'm in the company of your children, I see a brief glimpse of your glory, of your power, of your love through them. Lord, I thank you that we are different. Help us to be more different from the world. Help us to show each other the love of God. Help us to show the world the love of God. Lord, I pray that the words that we've just heard won't flee from us, won't uh, go out of our minds as we go out of the door, but that we may be able to dwell upon them through the day. I pray as we have a cup of tea together that you will bless that time of fellowship and that we'll be able to enjoy speaking of your word again. Lord, I pray that you will guard us and guide us and keep us from those sins that so easily have dominion over us. May we look to you as a creator and a redeemer, one full 